Our Bible reading this morning is from Mark chapter 11, verses 15 to 19, uh, the passage that Hing will be uh, expounding to us uh, in a little while. So Mark chapter 11, verses 15 to 19. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. I would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. You have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. And we said, Ping will be bringing that word to us. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see you all. Uh, the text uh, we just read today is again a very familiar story. As far as this con context is concerned, it is the sequel uh, or an extension of the story about the fig tree in uh, Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, uh, which uh, I just uh, shared with you, I think, last time I spoke to you. The two stories actually form one complete narrative. New Testament scholars would point out to us that this is a trademark of the author of Mark that he likes to uh, sandwich one story in the middle of another and allow them to interpret one another. The story traditionally called the cleansing of the temple still has important messages to us and uh, we should ponder it carefully. To put it succinctly, the message of the story is that God's people here represented by the temple, has failed in its mission and as a result stands under the judgment of God. And to put it in a positive note, the story calls for the people of God to be a light to the nations, to draw them toward God and his salvation. Our story picks up where the story of the fig tree left off. The day following Jesus' arrival at Jerusalem, in the morning, he went with his disciples to the temple, just like all pilgrims do. The text gives us the impression that Jesus did not just wander into the area, but went there with a purpose. The cleansing of the temple seems like the first series of actions which Jesus performed. Since what Jesus did there was mostly teaching, so the cleansing of the temple seems also to be a form of teaching, not just by words, but by actions also, just as he did with the fig tree outside Bethany. In order to understand the meaning of this symbolic action, a bit of background I think would be essential. In Jesus' day, uh, there were three basic Jewish festivals in which the Jews were required to make pilgrimage to the temple. These were the Passover, which falls between March and April. And then there's the Feast of Weeks, otherwise known as uh, the Pentecost, which falls between the months of May and June. And then finally, the, week, uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles, which also coincides with the Jewish New Year, which occurs uh, each year in, uh, between September and October. The Mosaic Law stipulated that pilgrims were not to come empty-handed, but brought with them gifts or sacrifices. Since the Jews were uh, scattered all around the Roman Empire, between Rome and Jerusalem, as well as in uh, North Africa, from Egypt to Carthage. 
uh, which is today's Tunisia. So this creates a problem. Since they will have to come over great distances, it would be impractical for them to bring uh, with them sheep or cattle or doves and so on to come uh, to the temple because these would mostly die, uh, likely die before they ever reach Jerusalem. In addition to animals, they will have to bring with them oils, flowers, wine, and salt for the sacrifices. So to solve this problem, the authorities, uh, that means the Sanhedrin, set up markets on the slope of the Mount of Olives to facilitate the pilgrims' purchasing of sacrificial animals like sheep, uh, cattle, and doves, and other necessities. The Sanhedrin have the responsibility to take great care of the animals to make sure all of these would be healthy and unblemished in compliance with all the sacrificial requirements. Uh, how about money changes? The reason was that every Jewish male aged 20 and above on pilgrimage to Jerusalem must bring with them a half shekel to pay the temple tax. In accordance with uh, the requirement in the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 30, 13 to 16, uh, only a half shekel is required so that everybody, uh, whether rich or poor, can afford it. Because there were a great variety of coins in circulation at the time, each with different civil content and thus uh, cash value. In order to maintain the standard of silver, the temple tax must be paid in a particular kind of coin, which was commonly called the Tyrian coin. Uh, this is a slide, uh, one of the examples. Why were they called the Tyrian coin? Because they were minted in the city of Tyre. So the money changers were on hand to facilitate the transaction, and in the process, they would charge a fee or some interest uh, so they could make some profit. So it is interesting to see that this coin uh, has the image of the foreign god Baal, Bali in Chinese. Here, Baal, oh, uh, back up please. Okay. Here, the image of Baal uh, is actually in the, guy, uh, in the disguise of a uh, Greek god. Uh, we all know that Baal uh, was actually a Canaanite god. And there's no image ever uh, existed of the image of Baal. But in the Roman coins, uh, they have the image of Baal in the disguise of a Greek god. So kind of a cultural mix here. So, uh, the fact that the corn has a foreign god on them uh, is very unusual because it is in total violation of the second commandment which forbids any kind of images. How, how, uh, how does it happen? The, it, the story is quite interesting. When uh, the Roman Empire closed down the mint in Tyre, they granted special permission for the people in Jerusalem, in Judea, to mint their own coins with one condition. Nothing uh, could be changed. So the image of this foreign god Baal remained on the coins. Because the Romans uh, did not want to give people the impression that Judea uh, was an autonomy, autonomous uh, state, so uh, to keep it, uh, uh, to keep the impression that the uh, Judea uh, was still under the rule of the Roman Empire, so they required uh, the Jews in uh, Judea to mint coins with this foreign god image on them. So uh, the image of Baal remained. So uh, yes, 
when the Jews rose up against the Romans uh, in AD 66 to 70, as a sign of independence, they minted new coins without the image of Baal and replaced it with traditional Jewish uh, motifs like uh, fruit and uh, plants and a shallot, uh, which is, uh, represent uh, the temple. So all these measures were there for the convenience of the worshippers. Therefore, the presence of merchants and many changes were originally a positive thing, serving uh, essential purposes. Now the obvious question then is, if there were already markets on the Mount of Olives, why were there mar uh, markets in the temple? The question points to the root of Jesus' actions. According to uh, Jewish sources, these markets were located within the temple precinct, in the court of the Gentiles specifically. The next slide. But they were set up by the temple authorities under the high priest Caiaphas. We all heard of Caiaphas. Uh, he was high priest in Jerusalem from 14 BC to 46 AD. He set up this market within the uh, temple precinct specifically to rival the markets under the supervision of the Sanhedrin on the Mount of Olives. It sounds very confusing, right? And it is quite confusing. The motives behind it was more political and financial than religious. And there was a possibility of corruption here. The pilgrims there uh, were obviously required to pay a higher fee or higher interest than the market over in uh, Mount of Olives. So this explains the saying in verse 18, the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Obviously, Jesus' actions were approved by the crowds. Now I think we are prepared to understand the motive behind the meaning of Jesus' actions. It is stated clearly in Jesus' pronouncement in verse 17. It says, as he taught them, I think most likely the temple authorities, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. This saying is actually made up of quotations of two different Old Testament passages. The first one is from Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, which states the true purpose of the temple, which reads these that means the foreigners and gen, uh, or, or the Gentiles. I will bring to my holy mountain, that is the temple, and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The second quotation is taken from the book of Jeremiah. Chapter seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 11. It says, Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been uh, watching, declares the Lord. This saying accuses the temple authorities of Jesus' time of corruption and subverting the purpose of God's temple. In Jesus' saying, a house of prayer for all nations has special significance. The Temple Mount of Jesus' time was divided into different zones. Yeah. You can see the building of the temple is right in the middle of the entire area. Uh, so uh, the, out, uh, the area outside of the uh, temple building is called the courts of the, ten, uh, 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 courts of the Gentiles. And the inner zone was called the court of the Jews and reserved, obviously, uh, for Jewish men and women. 
And at the center of this court of Jews was the building of the temple. The court of the Jews was surrounded by a solid wall. And there were signs placed at regular intervals warning the Gentiles not to enter this area on pains of death. Since the market in the temple precinct was set up in the court of the Gentiles, it would greatly reduce the space available to the Gentiles. Now among the Gentiles who enter the temple precinct are not just any uh, ordinary Gentiles. They were proselytes. That means they are, these are Gentiles, uh, whether Greeks, Romans, or some other nationality. Uh, they have uh, uh, they had accepted the Jewish faith, which means they were willing to give up their own gods and live according to the law of Moses. Uh, they uh, kept the Sabbath. Uh, they observed all the dietary laws to maintain a ritual a purity and holiness, even undergoing uh, circumcision. They did all these things, but one thing they cannot do, they could not do, and that is to enter into the area marked off uh, by the wall. They could not enter into the court of the, uh, of the Jews. Uh, First, you, will, uh, you remember the incidents caused by Paul uh, bringing uh, Greeks into the temple, uh, which is recorded in the book of Acts 21, 27 to 36. Uh, it started a riot there. And this information also sheds light on another passage, which is John uh, chapter 12, verse 20, which it says, now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. The festival may be the festival of Passover. And these Greeks entered the temple, not just there to visit. They were there to worship. That means these are Greek proselytes. And the book of John records that these Greeks, they came to seek out Jesus. They want to see specifically Jesus. And this, in turn, became a sign to Jesus that his hour has come. Now we can imagine what the presence of the market in the temple of his sin meant to those Gentiles proselytes. They could not pray and worship there freely as long as all these activities were going on. This was the only space available to the Gentiles but now was taken away from them. They were crowded out, so to speak. We can imagine the disappointment. Remember when Solomon dedicated the temple to the Lord, he described the temple as a place where the Israelites could pray to the Lord and the Lord will listen. Now it had become a marketplace where even Jews such as Jesus himself, were not comfortable there. What is special about the passage in Isaiah is that this is the only reference in the Old Testament to the temple as a house of prayer for the nations. Therefore, we understand why Jesus quoted specifically from Isaiah 56, verse 7, because it addresses the issue of foreigners who came to faith in the Lord. Isaiah said that one day after uh, one day they would be welcomed within the temple. Spaces will be made available to them. They should not feel excluded or being discriminated against. They were as much the people of God as the Israelites, regardless of their nationalities or what their physical conditions were. This is quite a remarkable passage, announcing universal salvation for all people on earth and equality among God's people, and anticipating the emergence of the church. What the authorities did with the temple contradicted the promise of God. The second quotation is even more powerful.
powerful. Just like the dens in our houses, which are spaces where we are most at home, feeling safe and protected, so are the dens of the robbers, where they could feel safe and can plot their schemes without interference. This quote was taken from Jeremiah 7, which is commonly called the Temple Sermon, because it was preached by the prophet Jeremiah in a temple addressed to the pilgrims, just like what Jesus did. In the sermon, Jeremiah accused the Israelites of hypocrisy, blatantly violating the law on the one hand, and came to the temple to offer sacrifices on the other, as if they were living just an innocent lives. Listen carefully what Jeremiah said. In verse 9, Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known? Notice here is a summary of the Ten Commandments, at least the second half. And then come, uh, verse 10, And then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name, and say, we are safe, safe to do all these detestable things. Verse 11, has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? Because I have been watching, declares the Lord. Comparing the temple, which was sacred and holy, to robbers' dens was meant to shock and exposed what these worshippers were really like. When Jesus applied the passage to the temple authorities, Jesus was accusing them of turning the Lord's temple to their private domain, by doing so, contradicting and subverting what the Lord has in mind for the temple. By chasing away the livestock merchants and money changers from the temple, Jesus was was restoring it to its original purpose, cleansing it of human presumption and arrogance. Further, Jesus enabled the Gentile proselytes to once again pray freely in the temple. This action would mean a lot to them, because to be admitted to the temple means more than just having access to a place of worship. It means to become fully a member of the elected people, which is in turn a fulfillment of the prophecy, uh, a fulfillment of Isaiah of prophecy. Read in the larger context of Mark chapter 11, uh, verses 12 to 14 and 20 to 21, the Jewish authorities at Jesus' time was a real life example of the fig tree which did not bear fruit. As such, they stood under God's judgment. And this will become clear when we read on to Mark chapter 12, 1 to 12, about the parable of the tenants. And in Mark 13, verses 1 to 2, where Jesus prophesied that the time will come when not one stone of the temple here will be left on another everyone will be thrown down. And here is a very clear example of what Jesus said. Uh, what Jesus said happened in AD 66 to 70, uh, where the Romans' 10th legion of the Roman army came and completely destroyed the temple. This picture is a very good illustration of the condition. Uh, on the left, uh, you see the facade of the Temple Mount as it was uh, originally built by Herod. And on the right, the tumble of stones, which is the, uh, the aftermath of the destruction by the, the, by the Romans. There's a mark on the wall there. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, that is a, a, a kind of a gutter uh, chisel in the facade, uh, which actually uh, shows the street level before the excavation. So uh, 
gives you an interesting picture. Anyway, the picture illustrates what the uh, destruction uh, of the temple in uh, Jerusalem by the Romans. And what is true for Israel is also true for the church, for us. Because in Christ, we have become the new Israel. What should we do to respond to Jesus' invitation? What then should the church do in order to become a house of prayer for the nations? Several months ago, Bill gave me a book to read. I'm a slow reader, so it took me some time to finish. And I did finish it. I took it with me on my holiday, uh, read it in the, I read it in the evening. Uh, no, it didn't put me to sleep. I was wide awake when I, uh, when I read it. The title of the book is uh, Burning in My Bones, which is a biography of the well-known pastor Eugene Peterson. At one point, Peterson was sent to start a new work in a town in Baltimore, USA. As a recently ordained pastor, he was handed a thick notebook which offers instructions on everything one needs to know in starting a new church, like how to organize a committee, how to put together a church calendar, how to manage a budget, how to implement evangelistic campaigns, and so on and so forth. In reading it, Peterson felt depressed because <laughs> he realized how little God has to do with any of it. He said, and I quote, the ink on my ordination papers wasn't even dry before I was being told by experts, so-called, in the field of church that my main task was to run the church after the manner of my brother and sister Christians who run service stations, grocery stores, corporations, banks, hospitals, financial services. The biographer goes on to say that Eugene felt alarm, not only because he sensed in his gut that this approach decentralized God, but because so many of these perceived needs were actually destructive, dehumanizing even antithetical to the gospel of Jesus. Well, these are sobering words to ministers as well as to church leaders. The experience of Eugene Peterson causes us to look at ourselves as individuals as well as a group. The question for us to ponder is, our lives, are our lives so cluttered with things that God is crowded out, decentralized, decentered, to use Peterson's term. Where is God in our lives? Is he front and center, or is he out in the sideline? Is he in control of our lives, or is he being manipulated to fulfill our needs, our desires? Is he our master or just a friend who we keep at arm's length? In quoting Peterson's words, I do not mean to say that this is a situation of Dedrick Baptist. Far from it. But what Peterson said in his biography causes us to reflect on us as a church and as individuals. As I read Peterson's words, one of the Beatitudes popped up in my mind. It was the sixth Beatitude, which says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Among all the Beatitudes, this is the one that most impresses me and challenges me. Pure in heart, what does that mean? I think it means the singleness of our purpose, not being distracted by other pursuits, guided only by the purpose of God. And the reward for those who strive to do so 
would be to see God. This is very remarkable. It did not say to perceive. It does not say to feel God. It says to see God. And what is remarkable about this is that seeing is not just in the future, not just in the eschaton, as we say, uh, in the end time, but the seeing is in the here and now, in our daily lives with all the struggles, challenges, and difficulties. How marvelous is this? Isn't that what we all want, to see God? The, challenges, the challenge is, of course, to keep our minds pure, which means focused, single-minded, complete and total dedication to God and his kingdom. Peterson felt strongly that his church has failed in this area because God was decentralized by other administrative pursuits. Perhaps other church failed because they pursue a larger congregation. Peterson also related that an expert of church development said that the success of a pastor was measured by the size of the parking lot. This reminds me about churches in America. The size of the parking lot is something to behold. You can get lost in it on Sundays. <laughs> this remark causes Peterson to wonder what the true aim and purpose of pastoral work is. So from very early on, he decided that his purpose his, in ministry was not to pursue size in number and size in church building, but really ministering to people who have, uh, who have real needs. Perhaps this is one of the ways that we can apply Jesus' saying in our lives at a church. On the literal level, I think Jesus' words in Mark 11-17 17, call us to unclutter our lives. I don't know if there's such a word, unclutter. But I think this is what Jesus calls us to do. Notice what the, church, uh, the text says in verse 16. In addition to driving out the merchants, Jesus would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. For merchandise, the word used in the NRSV translation is anything, which may well include things like utensils, like pots and pans, for cooking. Because when offering peace offerings, the people would actually cook the sacrificial meal at meat right there in the temple courts. What the text means is that other than using the temple as a marketplace, the people also use the courts, the temple courts, as shortcuts, carrying all sorts of things going in and out of the temple for their own convenience. They show no respect for the sacredness of the place and certainly forgetting whose place it is and what the place was for. If we want to respond to Jesus' word in order to unclutter our lives, we must allow God to take the central position in our hearts and in our lives. Just like Jesus said to the people at this time, we must put God back into the temple, so to speak. Then the temple will once again be the house of prayer for all nations. In closing, uh, let us recall what the author of First Peter said in First Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God 
through Jesus Christ. These words complement very nicely the declaration of Jesus and points us to the way of living it. We can gather from the epistle that the readers of First Peter lived under difficult circumstances, facing challenges, even the possibility of persecution. Against this background, the author of the epistle urges his readers in Asia Minor to live lives which are holy and dedicated to God, just like the temple in Jerusalem. We do not know the date of First Peter, some scholars would date it before the Jews uprising in AD 66 to 70. Some would date it after the event. Other scholars would date the epistle before the persecutions of, of Nero, which happened in AD 64. While others would date it to the persecution of Domitian, which happened in AD 95. Regardless, the author's concern and message then as now is clear. In whatever circumstances the Christians find themselves, they should live lives holy and dedicated to God, to Him alone. When First Peter was written, the temple may or may not be standing, but the image would be vivid and familiar enough for its readers to visualize what the author was saying. The image the author uses is very unique and bold, likening Christians to stones and building blocks. So the text reminds us that God will use us as material for his temple, which will glorify him and manifest his majesty. We are God's people. Our calling is to be a reflection of his glory. Nothing should detract us from living according to this purpose. Not Caesar, not anything. Furthermore, by dedicating ourselves totally to God, we will be able to draw other people to God. We will become a light to the nations, just like a beacon shining in a dark and stormy sea as it was uh, for Christians back then, so it is for us today. Jesus' invitation to the church remains the same, to be a house, for the, uh, house of prayer for the nations. And so it is the purpose of our being today. May, God, uh, may God's grace be with us all from today and forevermore.